All right, greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here, or Adams van Sale, here to shine a light on the goings on down south. And this episode is going to be focusing on something South African, a South African organization, but there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, if you are even a, a listener from abroad or living in a country that is not South Africa, uh, specifically countries where you want to really take on the state and take on the government and put. Uh, Put some weight behind what you're doing and the interesting thing is in south africa there's this thing that many in civil society understand as the balance of forces this is what the anc use uh, to decide when they are going to follow through of a policy or whether they're going to wait and stand back and they look at that balance of forces constantly and that's why i'm gonna have my guest on tonight is rob hutchinson he is uh, the chairperson of dear south africa an established south african civil society organization which facilitates public participation in government policy formation and basically to put it very simply they are in the business of tilting those balance of forces and putting weight behind uh, causes that will force the government into a corner or actually influence uh, government policy and we're going to be delving into that tonight exactly how they how they achieve that so welcome on the show rob i'm looking forward to it thanks thanks it's lovely to be here all right excellent so before we start i just want to uh share something on screen um that i think will demonstrate the type of con or what you are trying to achieve uh with dear essay so this is uh, if you're in south africa you know what i'm going to be showing here and you recognize the man on the screen so what i'm going to be showing you this is what happens when you really put pressure on politicians when you really push them into a corner and when you uh put public pressure on them and ask them to account for uh, for their actions uh, this is the type of reaction that you're going to get uh, most likely and I'm not going to take any nonsense of somebody who regards me as a garden boy today because you regard me as a garden boy. You come here, shut up! Shut up! Shut up! <laughs> I sat here, I sat here, I listened to you. I sat here. So that's the type of reaction that you get when. Uh you put politicians under pressure when you really uh, turn up the heat. And that's what that's uh, relating to the conversation tonight. Just for context, uh, that is uh, the Minister of Police of South Africa today um, <laughs> lashing out at uh, a concerned citizen from a, a civil society organization. So, Rob, uh, just to start off, I've done a previous episode, as I told you, uh, on what is AFRI Forum. And in this episode, I really want to treat it in the same way where I want to give people, the audience, an idea of what Dear Essay is, but pretty much what is your winning recipes, what's your philosophy, how the organization works, how you really get things done. But I think the, the simplest way to start off is really the question of what is uh, Dear Essay? If you were to be uh, put on the spot uh, to give an elevator pitch of what your organization is, what would you tell uh, that person? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually something we're grappling with ourselves because it's such an ever, ever-changing environment. To give it one sort of uh, one, a one-off description is, is not, not an easy task at all. But uh, let me give it a go anyway. Uh, Dear South Africa is a civil society organization that facilitates public participation in government policy formation processes. So we operate at all levels of government, the state-owned entities, institutions, and everything. Basically everywhere where government has to make a decision, uh, that decision under constitutional law has to go out for public consultation so that policies is you know made in, in, in a good way. And it considers both the needs of the public and the agenda of of government. All too often, government just puts out policy that uh, is suited to their needs, and it's often challenged by civil society after it's been promulgated into law. Our our system and our organisation, we sort of turn that on its head and approach it from a prevention is better than cure uh, mm -hmm. uh, angle. So we give the public an opportunity to have their say. On, on draft policy or policy amendments. Each public comment is um, individually packaged and delivered to government immediately on participation. And then we keep a public record of that participation and make it available to the public in a totally transparent manner. And that forms a great uh, foundation for any legal challenge that, that might follow 
at a later stage. And it's, it also places quite a lot of pressure on, on government because, you know, in, in South Africa, uh, a petition is treated as a single submission. Even if it has a million signatures or mm. two million signatures, government will treat it as a single submission from, from the public. Obviously, because the uh, every person who's signed it has agreed to the uh, mandate that is represented in that, in that petition. Our process um, almost presents every single individual uh, public voice or comment as an individual petition, which under law, government has to consider and acknowledge in the final decision-making process. So it's become quite an effective way to uh, influence policy decisions, uh, influence any decision or anything else that the government has to, uh, government presents to the public. Hmm. So you've touched on it, but maybe uh, just to, to further clarify, what what <laughs> part of what DSA does really gives government the most problems? What kind of forces them to acknowledge what you do and to take into account what you do? I mean, if you were to uh, not uh, if you were to not look at exactly what DSA does and you just look at petitions, there are other examples like uh, Change.org and those types of uh, websites that don't really always get the reaction from government that they are uh, aspiring to. What what ingredient is there in your recipe that actually forces government to react to what you do? Well, under, under the law, they have to acknowledge every single comment that does come through. And uh, uh, if I can refer back to change.org, as, as, as you did there, the problem there is that it's a great uh, mouthpiece for, for the public. It, you can judge public sentiment through change.org and get an idea of what frustrates the public. But it carries no impact at the at the end of the day, where because it's all up to the petition organizer, who could just be an ordinary member of the public, to follow through on the results of that petition. We do it completely differently. We interact with government right from the word go, and as long as we, as well as delivering a complete summary of the participation on on an event, we also make sure that every single individual comment has to be acknowledged and government has to show proof thereof before they can actually go ahead with head with the policy so we don't we don't it's not about the number or the, the quantity of of people who participate it's always about the quality so we try we make the public comments visible to to everyone we provide as much information as we can official documents and and so on and then if uh, the decision, because we have the results before government actually does, because we filter everything through to government, if government go, makes a decision that's against uh, the public or has flouted public participation rules and regulations, then we have the evidence to immediately take them on in court, have the whole process restarted or set aside as, as the case may, may require. Mm. And uh, has there been instances where uh, you've uh, actually uh, had to produce the, the evidence of your, for example, like you said, you publish all the records of every campaign, but has there been a, a, a case where the government has tried to almost uh, call your bluff and then you had to show them, but no, actually, we've got the goods, we've got the receipts? Many times, in fact, almost on every case. And we've run, uh, we've completed about over 300 campaigns to, to date in the past four years. And I think the most obvious one, or obvious case of that was during the COVID regulations when the Minister of Cooperative Governance, uh, Tlamini Zuma, uh, mentioned the public participation around the tobacco regulations. Mm. And she came out with this ridiculous claim that 2,000 people had participated and said that they approved the regulations and that smoking should be banned. We, of course, ran the public participation process for that. And in i think it was 48 hours that the minister gave for for their public participation we managed to send i think it was close to 12,000 i could be wrong on that on wrong my figures but around 12,000 individual public comments through and we did the analysis and the minister we caught the minister out red-handed lying so mm. yeah she had to with, withdraw that that statement and another interesting one was um on the communication side was electoral something to do with the electoral act amendment bill and um the it was around actually i'm lying it was about the COVID regulations around closing schools and the government actually used our report and our representation and our claim 
uh, in a case against them. And the case was from another civil society group wanting to keep schools closed. And we actually justified through the public participation process that it, it should actually be uh, the public wanted it open for under nines and so on. And we had all the legal uh, evidence to support that. So, yeah, it's been a, it's a good relationship that we have with government on some fronts. And then uh, we have to take take control and uh, hold the government to account on on other fronts. It's uh, quite interesting. Mm. Mm. No, absolutely. It's uh, I think, as I told you uh, off air, I think you're doing some pioneering work that a lot of people actually <laughs> can can inspire in other countries people to to build similar type of organizations. And the the lucky yes. thing is, South Africa is blessed with. Uh, many civil society organizations. I think it's one of the things that is uh, keeping many things together is uh, all these different organizations. But maybe we should start off at the beginning. Uh, can you give us, you don't have to give us a lecture on uh, uh, DSA's history, but just the, the <laughs> short story of it. Uh, where did it all start and how did we, how did we get here? Uh, and how long ago was that? We started about four years ago. It was 2018. Um, ran our, our first campaign it was a local campaign and it was just a it was just a side hobby project you know i had i'd recently left uh Arta. it was uh, was a civil society organization and they focused on on etals and fighting electronic tolling in in south africa and that whole process went to court because of a lack of public participation in in that decision making making process mm -hmm. the public were, weren't aware what was going on with with etals and next thing these gantries pitched up on on the roads and nobody knew, even knew what they were and then we found out it was to charge people for for roads that had already been built and for use usage of those roads and then uh, the organization took uh, government to court and it was discovered that only 25 people had responded to to government's call for comment on that and to this date, I don't think there's any evidence around who participated or what they said. So that whole case was many years. I don't think it's even been resolved yet, though we still have ETOLs and so on. But throughout that whole process, after leaving after leaving out, I thought, you know, I'm into civil society. This is this is my life. I've been full-time civil activist for about you know over 10 years. And I thought, no, let's let's start something that carries on on in that vein. And public participation was it. And there was a certain lack of, of public participation in all government processes. No government would just tick the box and say, we had government, uh, we had public participation. Three or four people had their say. Uh, other government organizations had their say. We can carry on here. And I thought, no, that's not quite right. The public needs to be involved in, in this kind of thing. After all, it is mandated in the Constitution. So... We ran a, a local campaign with one of the municipalities, and uh, I think we sent through about sixty-one thousand individual comments through to through to them on a levy that they wanted to introduce locally, and that it was astounding because normally the municipality receives maybe two hundred or so on 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 a sim, on similar projects, and because of that they withdrew it. They couldn't uh, didn't have the capacity to go through all all the public comments, even though. They, they had to show evidence that they had. So they withdrew it and thought, wow, that's actually quite effective. So it just grew from there and became a proper uh, nonprofit when we started receiving requests from uh, the public to run campaigns on other issues. We expanded it nationally. And then I think the first big campaign we took on was the airport's name change. Right, I remember then, that, yeah. Yeah, that was absolute chaos and then I think we received 21,000 uh, individual public comments, delivered them all through, got a bit of recognition there. And then a bit later, it was uh, the first call for under expropriation without compensation, should the constitution section 25 be amended to accommodate uh, with, with compensation. And there we saw a great opportunity and yeah, we launched the national national campaign on that and absolutely flooded, absolutely flooded with with input from from the public. Uh, interesting enough, from both sides of the fence, we had a lot of uh, EFF supporters uh, promoting it and saying, yes, it should should go through. And eventually mm. we 
we ended up sending, uh, it was 229, 239, 230,000 individual uh, comments through to, mm. to Parliament. And after we did the analysis, I think it was 57% said no, we shouldn't amend amend the constitution and the balance said yes go ahead and do it and we decided to make a bit of a, a you know, scene about it so we actually printed out each and every comment onto an individual piece of paper <laughs> and delivered i think it was like 74 boxes two tons of paper through to parliament and said yes, and they have to check it they have to go through all of it <laughs> they had to go through all of it yeah it's like paying your toll fines in five cents <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah it was exactly that a bit of a publicity stunt but it mm. it 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 showed the the power of, of public participation and how the people when it when involved when engaged and aware of of these issues can actually uh, make a huge difference and then yeah. they ran about i think about three other campaigns on on expropriation without compensation and throughout that whole process over the past uh, over the three years that followed we've sent close on a million uh, individual public comments through to to government on one single issue and as, as you know they did vote on it in parliament and it was it was withdrawn so who knows it might come back but we're ready if it does yeah absolutely i think uh, the fight for private property rights in south africa is not going to be one where it's ever relaxed you're always going to have to be uh, <laughs> eternally vigilant um but maybe i mean this might to you be a, a stupid question but why if you were to if you were to talk to the general public in south africa how would you convince them or what would be your pitch that they should rather send their comments through dear essay than just uh, sending a comment themselves or uh, commenting on on social media uh, why should they go through your almost like portal to god government <laughs> That's a great question. I'm actually going to use a, a recent example, and that being the amendments to the Health Act. As as we know, there's we've had huge participation on on that and calls from governments and extension extensions and so on. And during, Excuse during me, the just before you continue, process, can you just give some context on uh, what exactly that is for people that are unaware? Sure. Like I say, what government has proposed is moving the regulations, which were uh, temporary regulations housed under what's called the Disaster Management Act, mm. regulations that control COVID, how it should be maintained, uh, mitigated, and, and so on. All the COVID measures, uh, government has proposed to move them to be permanently placed underneath the National Health Act, which is obviously a dangerous situation as you know, government can in enact them at any time for any given disease, not just COVID and, and so on. But they did put, put the draft regulations out for, for public comment and have invited the, the, the public at large right. to have their say okay. on yeah, how they should be implemented. Yeah, no, that's, that's, the, the that's the context, shop. Good. So during that process, um, we, we discovered, obviously we set up a campaign which sends people's comments directly through to, to the minister. And going, going through it all, we realized that it shouldn't just be sent to, to one recipient in government. There's actually four pieces of legislation in there, each with a different recipient. So we set up our system that if you make one comment, it will send you, you select which uh, part you want to comment on or what's your top concern, which is aligned directly to the uh, clause or uh, regulation that needs to be amended and mm. that goes straight through to government and to the exact right person it should do and then of course we sent it to all four and and to that person and what came back was a lot of people were saying oh my comment was uh, deleted without even opening oh, right yeah now our system tracks that so we can actually see if government's opening them and if they are mm -hmm. clicking any links inside there and how long it takes them to open, how long they open for, and, and so on. And we went through it through through our data, and we, we noticed immediately government wasn't opening a single one of them, and they had actually deleted a whole bunch of them without, without even reading it. Right. And if the comments weren't done through our system, we would not have picked that up. Uh, government could have claimed anything. They, they actually went so far as to say they only received 50,000 comments on it where we had known for a fact that we'd sent over 300,000. Hmm. So 
and we knew the results of every single one. So the benefits of using uh, our platform as opposed to direct engagement is that there's a, a public, publicly accessible record of each and every participant, plus their comment, what, what they said. Of course, their private details are, are redacted, not, not available. Um, yeah, but the government but, can't pull any shenanigans. Exactly, exactly. So mm. it promotes uh, transparency, full accountability, and just makes the whole process more more publicly sound, put it that way. Mm. And if government looks at it, well, they should be praising it because it actually raises trust levels in in what they're doing. But they fear it because <laughs> everything's now exposed <laughs> and yeah. in the public space here. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. Now, let, let's just take into account what you said there. I just want to read uh, uh, some quotes from their internal emails, which is very funny. So, uh, and I quote, anti-progressive, instigating <laughs> terrorism, still in quotations, sabotage and forcing government to waste resources. This is how groups opposed to government's uh, proposed health regulations are characterized in internal emails floating around in the Department of Health. So this was recently reported in the media. And I know um, uh, Dear Essa is thrown in there, AfriForum is thrown in there. <laughs> what just how do you react to that? Just the knowledge that this is how they talk about you in their internal emails. <laughs> well, it's it's quite amusing, really. It is because you know, it's to be expected, actually. I mean, we had a court challenge against the those, those regulations, and you know, it's typical underhanded tactics to try and drive a, a smear campaign or influence uh, judges or decision makers in in the court case. Or who knows? It's it's just a government that's totally out of touch with with what's actually happening there. And I, I found it completely interesting because we actually have a good relationship with other departments in in government who have entrusted us to run their public participation processes for them because they don't have the resources to do it and they appreciate our work and ask us for the reports and and so on and so on yet on the other hand we have the health minister and his department accusing us of <laughs> exactly what you said they're even going so far as to call us terrorists and saboteurs i think yeah it was definitely underhanded tactics there and it was yeah. it clearly showed that they've got something to hide and we had the the evidence to reveal their, their hand straight away mm -hmm. so yeah, um, I... doesn't 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 yeah, it doesn't bring up any feelings of fear or anything like that i think it's it's actually a credit mm -hmm. to what to what we're doing yeah i know when you're taking that type of flack it means you're you're right over the target and it's i just find it very rich coming from a political party that has a history of actually having a genuine terrorism wing um <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes <laughs> so I, I think they're pretty aware about what terrorism is and what uh, terroristic act what constitutes mm -hmm. as terroristic acts and sabotage but uh yeah that uh, uh that adds it may be so Maybe there's something else that I think a lot of people uh, need the reassurance of is how how do you fight? The best word I can use for is actually just petition fraud. I don't know if that's even a, a concept, mm. but how do you stop, for example, malicious actors flooding your system with just a, a bunch of uh, uh, fraudulent uh, signatures or uh, using uh, all types of different, I don't even know what type of tactics they are, but uh, mm. you probably have dealt with many of these threats that would not only water down, but also delegitimize your, uh, your efforts. Yes. So we have actually had a few um, attempts at that to de delegitimize the whole process, but there's many checks and balances in place on, on our system. So we can detect uh, IP addresses, we can detect uh, other more sensitive details as well, and all, all to keep it open and honest. We have to, we have to if, if in case government wants to audit our process, obviously mm -hmm. we have to have things in, in order and we record absolutely everything so we can see um, there's algorithms to check regular patterns and we act in one of those incidences we saw i think it was about twenty thousand um, individual comments came through from a single ip address mm. and they, they followed a very specific pattern so it was obviously a script or a bot that someone had put 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 in place to sway the to sway the public opinion in in a certain direction, and those were all flagged as illegitimate uh, um, submissions, 
and we, we we put that aside and then did make did put that in our in our report as well so it's it's not uncommon we we have a lot of um a spam but we filter it out immediately and also we must remember that it's you can make more than one comment if you think of something at a later stage um, that you didn't have in your original submission you you're fully entitled to to have another submission it's not a voting system it's not a it's not a referendum it's simply your opportunity to negotiate uh, the, the draft policy that government has presented to you mm. so you can have your say as many times as as you like and uh, we, we do encourage people to actually leave a comment so it's not just a yes or no vote mm. but actually ha have your say and then we spot the trends as well and give people options of and ideas of what they should be commenting on what they should be looking out looking out for and when we do that analysis we can easily see if there's been a data injection right. or or something else yeah we can't fully block it or prevent it from from happening but we do monitor it and can filter yeah. out the the well, I say disease data is that yeah. word? And cool. I think, <laughs> and I think it's uh, it's also good that it is you are incentivized to do that as well because it's your legitimacy yeah. that's on the line. the The government can audit yeah. you at any time, so I mean, you've got to have the the goods to deliver. If I can put it that way, if the government comes and exactly. peeks behind the curtain and there's nothing there, th that's the end of the ASA. Exactly right, and it's the end of public participation in general. So we don't mm -hmm. we don't want to uh, destroy that whole process. So. It, it's definitely one of our top concerns there and something we are constantly on top on top of mm. like i said we can't stop it because there might be legitimate requests like that where companies use a single ip address and say there's four thousand employees that we're going to be injecting something or making a comment from from that single ip address but like i said there are other processes in place and we do encourage people to give their uh, email addresses as well because that also legitimizes it. We send a reply with a copy of their, their submission back to them and monitor that whole process as well. So we can see if those automated replies are actually acknowledged and read and delivered properly mm. too, and then correlate all the data together to weed out the, the, mm, <laughs> disease data <laughs> <laughs> yeah i see uh um bav z 307 says dirty corrupt, corrupt data. Data is the term. all right that's the one uh <laughs> just a reminder uh to the people listening and uh, that are able to type in the chat you can ask rob and me any questions you can type it in there and i'll get to as many as possible and here is a question rob for you from gordon durant who asks when do we get an app <laughs> yes wow that's on the cards absolutely is and that i've always been yeah you know, i've never been fond of apps because you know, the, the big trick with an app is to get people to actually download it and install it on their smartphone mm -hmm. and yeah but we we definitely playing around with that also uh, if we when we do get the app right uh, it'll be data free so i think that'll be the incentive for people to to actually download it and and use it and then participate through that and then a whole lot of other features will will be added to that app communication and and so on but yeah an app is without a without a doubt the the way to go and that'll open yeah. up to new markets but definitely the data free portal will be will be integral to to that <laughs> mm. and uh, you've touched on many of your success stories but are there any uh, that you've uh, not uh, told us about or that you'd like to elaborate on uh, I'll, I'll have give you opportunity now if there's if you think you've covered everything don't be don't be shy to to indicate mm -hmm. that but if there's anything else you want to share about those success stories uh, the floor's all yours now oh thanks thanks Ernst. yeah this is actually a great success story you know we fully believe in collaboration we we are no by no means the the heroes in in this game and we don't want to be seen as the heroes we simply are a vehicle which in, empowers the public places the power of democracy back in their hands and we collaborate with a lot of other civil society organizations and we believe that that strengthens the approach of of civil society as, as a whole a great example was amendments to the electoral act government actually didn't publish these in in the government gazette like they are compelled to do and um, an organization uh, it's ir actually picked it up 
in the you know Sunday paper. It was just an ad that was placed there, and they picked it up on the final day for allowed for commenting. And the first thing we did is, well, they contacted us. We uh, sent some an email and some uh, legal letters to the minister, requested an extension, which was which was granted. Uh, only seven days extension was granted on that, and. Uh, the the reason we we were concerned about it, or the IR was concerned about it, was because there were um, some vague clauses in that which allowed for an alternative form of voting, and that was electronic voting at at that stage, and it was just the palaver about uh, what happened in the US with the electronic voting there and the mail and ballots and so on. So it was a, a bit of a concern and a valid one, mm. and. In one week, we managed to send, I think it was also about 16,000 individual comments through. So we, we let, informed our database and our subscribers of what, what had happened. And because of that pressure from, from the public, government actually withdrew those, those clauses from, from the proposed amendment. And mm. that, that was immediately, to me, one of the best success stories ever. It involved collaboration, it involved feedback from the public, it involved public pressure and it showed the impact that an active and engaged civil society can actually have on serious important matters before they actually uh, actually surface even when government is trying to be devious about it by not mm -hmm. by not publishing it in in the government gazette it's a wonderful yeah. success story well that uh, that adds to a, a comment here in the chat matt j says exposure of the sneaky policies that our appointed officials try to pass is vital well that's the thing if you go to uh dear essays website and there's a link in the description you'll see they are constantly keeping you up to date on what the, the government is plotting and i think rob that's maybe that's maybe one of the fun the almost like bonus functions of your organization is that even if people don't participate if they just visit your website they can see exactly what the government is plotting and it's uh, i think that's yeah. actually also a, a little bit of a bonus uh, almost like a a, a a a supplement to uh, uh for many people that don't have the time to just go check the government gazette constantly exactly exactly so we check it every friday we do go through it and we do highlight the important issues. We also let our subscribers know and through the Facebook page and a very active Telegram group and uh, Twitter and everything else. And yeah, you know, keep the public up to date. If there's enough interest from, from the public or if we see uh, media interest in, in something that's vital or I mean, sometimes we just, we just pick it up and say, this is of, of interest to the public. Then we create a, a proper campaign around it, provide summaries, videos, explanatory notes, and and so on. Mm -hmm. And we rely a lot on public input as well from on, on a lot of campaigns. If there's a great comment, then we will try and highlight, highlight that. Uh, if, the, if another organization has something else to say and there's more specialists in, in that field, then we give them the platform to say, put your stuff forward have your say, do whatever you want. And the, the interesting interesting part of that is you know, campaigns tend to take a certain lean towards the right, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which is which is quite interesting because uh, we don't plan it that way. We present we present the platform as a nonpartisan platform, open for anyone to use. We don't drive an agenda through it at all. We simply uh, allow the public to have their say in favor for, against, or somewhere in between, and then obviously state their concerns or valid reasons as to why to justify their selection. And the the platform does, the campaigns tend to go towards the right always. And mm. uh, it took me a while to figure out why it, why it was like this. And it's, it's obvious, really, you know, if you have a, a, a government that is obviously left focused and a left leaning government, then you can have a right leaning civil society. And mm. you mentioned this balance of power that, to me, that's where the balance of power does sit. It sits between government and civil society as a whole. And if we had a, a right-leaning government, there's no doubt we'd have an active left uh, on in civil society. And then again, that the platform would serve its purpose in the non-partisan way as, as, it, as it does now. But it's not to say that you know, people must oppose policy that, that comes out all the time. There's some fairly decent policy that does does come out. Um, 
it's not always perfect, nothing ever is, but the ones that get the most engagement are the ones that people are generally upset about. And we should be seeing more push from, from both sides. So if this government's put out a good policy, then go and support it or uh, tell them that this is how policy should be. Mm. But yeah, it, it never ends up that way. People like to protest. Uh, anger tends to drive participation. And well, that's, that's just the way it goes. Mm. Yeah, well, the, I think, again, that, that whole concept is the balance of forces. I mean, that's the that's the lens that the ANC approach reality through. And at the same time, mm -hmm. it's almost as sacred to the ANC that approach as the, the National Democratic Revolution. But what you're describing there is often when you think about tipping that balance of forces, it's a it's a negative push against something, but you yeah. can have an influence on the balance of forces through support or something positive just as easily. Um, if you support, for example, let's say in, once in a blue moon, uh, the ANC proposes a, a, a sensible policy. I mean, a clock, a, even a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, <laughs> then you need to uh, get behind that policy. Don't just oppose it out of uh, an anti-government st uh, stance, but rather... Yeah. Is this actually something that's going to improve or help the the, the, the society at large? Um, yeah. There was a question here for you, Rob, from Matt J, who asks, does Rob have much communication with other civil organizations, civil society organizations? Constant communication, constant communication. That's that's the key to success in civil society. Yeah, it's very easy to isolate yourself and put yourself in a little bubble where you're answering your own questions and listening to your own members and so on. But you know, public participation in the way that we do it is all about great dialogue. And from that dialogue emerges solid policy and good decisions. And there might be opposing points of view, and uh, but doesn't matter because what comes out together is absolute magic. And I think that's, that's the, the vital part about it. As I said earlier on, we're not, we're not experts in any particular field other than uh, public participation processes. So communication with uh, business oriented groups, uh, minority oriented groups and any anything, any any groups, that's their specialty and we'll bring them in, communicate with, with them, give us the good points or the bad points of this policy in the way that you see it and let's present them through there. It's all about communication. Communication in public participation is absolute king. Mm. I see uh, Koketso Rezane says uh, they always lean towards the right because SA is a conservative country. <laughs> so, yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, that's what the polling says as well. Uh, the ANC and uh, many uh, in the commentariat might actually try to make you believe otherwise. But uh, go talk to some regular <laughs> South Africans. You're going to get a, a completely different view. Now, um, Rob, something else that, that's come up now is that uh, you talked about... Uh, DSA, now that we're talking about ideology, you said DSA doesn't have a bias or any type of leaning towards uh, any ideology. But how do you choose which campaigns to do? How do you choose which things to uh, to put on your site? I mean, you can't do public participation on every proposed law or little alteration that the government would do. That's not feasible. What yeah. what recipe or lens do you use to to filter uh, what uh, you 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 pursue if not uh, an ideological uh, an ideological one? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's tough to keep ideology out of out of anything because you know you you succumb to your own personal bias, and whereas my my personal bias might um, I might have a personal bias I think everyone does, we try to keep the organisation as as neutral as possible, so it's never well sometimes it's a a bull comes up, um, we see the media response to it first of all, and or we we take our own judgment. And we ask around within within the organization, is this a good idea? Do we do it? What are your opinions first? Mm. Should should we launch it? And I think over the past four years, we can we've got a pretty good idea of which campaigns will uh, raise public interest. And it's generally those that are uh, taking an authoritarian approach from from one side or 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 the other, where government is implementing implementing policies that are clearly not suited for for South Africa or South Africans yeah. or even developed 
in South Africa. Yeah, for I think South a Africa. good example would be that uh, that case that you took, or the way you took on the um, the that firearms legislation that was being yes. uh, the being proposed of taking out the the reasoning of uh, owning a firearm for self defence. Yes, well, obviously that that is a huge contentious issue with with many South Africans, and that's that's actually a really good example because our first approach there was to get comment from uh, Gun Free SA, and I uh, found, found the comment, we put it on, and then uh, we were told blatantly, take it off, take it off by, by Gun Free SA. I couldn't understand why. Like, you know? Don't you want to participate? Sense. Don't you want to show your power? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So <laughs> so then we, we it was obviously open to everyone, and uh, there was some great input on that, and then the legislation was, uh, was it withdrawn? Yes, it was. It was shelved again. Mm. Yeah. But just to see, you know, it, we don't hold any bias there. We say, groups, if you're for it or you're against it, give us your reasons. Give the public something to go on and let the public decide at, at the end of the day uh, mm -hmm. what is good and what is bad. Don't force your opinions on them, but present them. Present your good arguments. Mm -hmm. And then and it was just weird to see you know, this was a perfect opportunity for an organization that was anti-gun to to put their views forward on on a highly popular campaign yeah and they pulled out of it strange strange yeah, no, yeah. very strange if you you're giving the opportunity to really flex your muscles and you're like now nah, I'll, I'll pass but i'm very strong yeah. you have to believe me <laughs> exactly trust me. yeah, yeah. No, um, we're anti-gun but we don't want our stuff on your valid public participation platform yeah. we'll submit it ourselves <laughs> yeah no, now, crazy. rob maybe for uh, for international listeners that uh, want to take inspiration from what you do in your model that you you utilize what would you say are some of the big i wouldn't say principles but rather lessons you've learned and the advice that you would give if anyone out there wants to outside of south africa wants to create something similar or even just take elements from your from your design and from your model to to benefit their their uh, their mm. uh, attempts to to influence government. Definitely. Well, first first step is well done for taking that initiative. I think every, every everybody should be more involved in in the democracy, and that's that's the idea of of participative democracy is being involved in the day to day decisions that that do come up. Maybe not every day, but you know, being more involved than just once you know, every election cycle. And I think the most difficult hurdle for us is getting feedback from, from government. So first establish those, those relationships with, with government, identify who the decision makers are. If there's committees in, in your parliament, if you have a parliament, go, go establish those and check out or should I say investigate the the rules and legislation governing or surrounding a, a public participation and how it's meant to be carried out, and then assist the public to do so. Clearly def define uh, the difference between valid public participation and petitions. We spent a lot of time and effort in, in, in the beginning uh, trying to get the public to understand that difference, and then the impact that public participation in valid decision-making processes can can actually have. And I think the most important thing, I mentioned uh, feedback from government, but it's also feedback to the participants. Keep them in that loop. Keep them encouraged. Let them know that their, their voice is being represented in, in the process or in parliament or wherever it's going to go, and that it actually does matter and does make a difference. You know, it's all too often, I think people suffer from what I call a petition fatigue and participation fatigue, where we have our say, we sign petitions that nothing ever seems to to happen. Mm. And you forget about it, it and does. then two years later you remember, oh right, I signed that petition to have Donald Trump deported to Mexico and nothing ever <laughs> happened. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly he came back with three or <laughs> three times stronger yeah but that's exactly it so keep people uh, updated as to the events that are happening whereabouts it is and and so on and just stay there be tenacious man don't give up mm -hmm. just don't give up keep keep at it and it definitely definitely does make a difference mm -hmm. it really does well the easier way of course would be there's a lot of technique technical and 
technology associated hurdles that you have to get over. Um, but we've all, we've sorted all of that out uh, out already. It's taken about four years of development in the processes to make sure things are legitimate, uh, legal, and um, compliant, not just locally but also globally. And <laughs> contact us, then we'll set something up in in your country for you to run in in no time at all. <laughs> Right. And then uh, something else that I think I would add to uh, answer my own question that I've picked up from all your answers tonight is that uh, absolute just transparency is uh, of paramount importance yeah. and that building that legitimacy of your organization. You're right. And you're right. It's such a vital point. Um, the, the basis of public participation is trust, absolute trust. And remember that if you're going to start an organization like DSA that does it, you're the buffer between government and civil society. And that develops the trust that is so needed between government and civil society. You're literally the, the trust watchdog. So you, mm -hmm. you have to be yeah. completely open and, and transparent. And yeah, and sometimes you have to question yourself and question yourself quite often because you can get sucked up into, into ideology very quickly. So remaining neutral is, is the way to go as well. Mm. Right. And then also, I think uh, something that uh, is important uh, just from, from my experience, I mean, AfriForum has worked with DSA quite a few times. Um, how, what would your lessons be in that inter-organization, building those relationships and really making it work as a, well, not as a team, but working with other organizations. What have you learned from that? Because I think uh, it's it's one thing building your own organization. It's a completely other thing building a, a network of re reliable mm -hmm. allies. Yeah. No, it was, look, it's it's very tough. Right in the beginning, it, we struggled a lot because you know, it's a it's unfortunately it's quite an ego driven uh, industry. A lot of lot of right. players in. In, in South Africa, particularly, are, are there for fame and fortune. And once you get past that and present yourself as not a threat, but definitely a partner in what you do, then I think you've crossed that, that crossed that barrier. But what you what you have to understand is that uh, we all have strengths and weaknesses, and you have to acknowledge your your weaknesses as as the most foremost thing. And then understand that the person that you're partnering with has strengths that, that you don't. And that together there is a common thread. And that common thread is simple. It's we just want government to be a better government at the end of the day. It doesn't matter which side of the fence you stand on or what your ideology is. We all have that same common thing. We want our government to be a better government. And the way we go about it is different. But we're all headed in the same direction. And I think that's the key. We've, there's definitely a shift in, in civil society now. There's a great collaboration happening everywhere. And that's, it's, it's really heartwarming to see. It gives me so much hope to actually see, I don't want to call it a united uh, civil society, but it's more a, a coordinated civil society that, that approaches things. And that, that, that is unbelievable strength. It really is. As I said earlier, uh, South Africa is blessed with uh, many uh, very robust civil society organizations. I mean, it's one thing to claim to stand for something or to claim to be able to do something. But once you've got some notches in your belt, as DSA has and as AfriForum has, uh, you start building a name for your for your organization. You start building a reputation as you deliver uh, what you say you're going to do. And I think that yeah. building that momentum, I would say just from my own uh vantage point uh, looking at the essay uh, from the outside looking in only really recently that you really get that wind in your sails i mean you've you've really recently specifically in 2022 have picked up a lot of yeah. momentum that wasn't there previously has that been exactly. your experience as well 100 percent, yes 100 percent. and i think that's mainly to do with with covid and the lockdowns to be mm -hmm. to be dead honest there was a great uh i like to call it the great awakening uh, amongst mm -hmm. the public, where you know, governments across the world were setting regulations. And suddenly the public realized that everything they do, absolutely everything is governed by policy and, and regulations. And the balance However, of forces. <laughs> once again, yes, it's right. amazing how it keeps coming up. And if right. we look at, look at civil society, you can see that all, all problems are created by overbearing or missing or unjust legislation or outdated legislation. 
And, you know, I think, as I said, during COVID, people were aware that government was just changing legislation and going on. And we thought, no ways. This is our job as a public participation uh, well, that organization that facilitates public participation. We thought, let's, let's just jump in there, make a big fuss. And, and we definitely, definitely did. It was, oh, it was great. Overturning three of, the, of COVID regulations uh, mm. due to public pressure keeping up that pressure, keeping government under under watch and you know, promoting accountability. And mm. that's shifted everything. I think absolutely everything has has changed now. The whole whole of South Africa, I think the whole globe is aware of 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 the power that, that can be handed to the people if they are engaged and mm. willing to to have their say on on policy. Right, but that's why it's integral to have civil society organizations like Dear Essay. I mean, that that is in the end the the the, the portal through which, as I said earlier, people reach uh, touch the government on their studio to use a South African metaphor. <laughs> uh, exactly. That's how you that's how you get to government is is through yeah. the because in the end you can have a hundred thousand people, but if they don't have a, a, a metaphorical highway to walk uh, along towards their target or towards their destination, they're just going to be wandering aimlessly. So the thing is, and that's the principle that Afri Forum also operates on, is that you give people yeah. these institutions to rally around. You give them these organizations that concentrate their energy and concentrate their focus. And uh, yeah. that's that's exactly what uh, DSA has achieved. And I think that's that's why I wanted to do one of the reasons I wanted to do this episode as well is to inspire people in, in abroad in other countries or even in South Africa to replicate that energy in their own way and to replicate that type mm. of building institutions, building organizations, rather than just uh, telling people on social media, do something. Uh, why don't you do something? Why don't you start building mm. something that's going to last and going to build momentum and something you're going to be proud of? Yeah, oh, well said. That's exactly what it is. It's about placing the power back in the hands of the people. That's that's what we that's what we focus on, and we're just the vehicle. We're just the vehicle mm -hmm. for that. And people who participate are are the fuel that that drives that vehicle. Mm -hmm. The more people mm -hmm. that participate, the, the stronger that that vehicle gets, and the further it can go. But yeah, it's up up to the people eventually to to take that. Uh, I love that analogy. It's just working working together and building up something that that actually lasts is is hugely rewarding and then mm. seeing something yeah there's a great there's a there's a great comparison when facebook first came out people would start causes and and so on and then everybody would click like and then the next mm. day you know nothing has changed you've just clicked like public participation in this form actually turns that like into real world action real world yeah. action that is measurable that creates impact and gives you that same sort of dopamine release that i've done something because you have you have done something your comment has actually been put forward and it has influenced policy before any matters arise and that's i think you know, i think it's a shift in in public perception as well we can it no longer have to go to the streets with placards and and marches and and so on we can actually, mm. I don't want to say protest or but participate from mm. the comfort of your armchair, which is, <laughs> yeah, bring bring on those armchair activists. We've given <laughs> you a place to actually make an impact. <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, I'm going to take one more question from the, the chat and then we're going to uh, start wrapping up. So the last question here is from Matt J who asks, Rob, can we comment on an, and impact existing laws or must that be challenged in the courts? Yeah, so there's there's two ways to do that. I think the easiest way is um, through proper public participation. You can raise uh, a private member's bill. So a private member's bill can only be submitted through a member of parliament. However, it can be drafted by anyone in the public. Anyone in the public who thinks there needs to be an amendment to some legislation or law can mm. draft that and discuss it with, with other groups uh, get legal legal people involved, test the constitutionality of, and then present it to a member of parliament who can then present it as a private member's bill. And that goes through the whole process of public participation. If parliament approves it, uh, it proves it that it will, can be discussed, it'll go to a committee, a committee will then draft it, 
published in the Gazette, and the public can, can have their say and influence that bill immediately. And I think that is the way it should always go. Wouldn't mm -hmm. it be wonderful to have a political or member of parliament who represents civil society organizations and their sole function is just to submit private members' bills? That would be mm -hmm. quite a game changer there. Mm, well, that's uh, that's definitely something for the future. Uh, I see here uh, Sandy Wills says, Rob Hutchinson, you are the best. Thank you for everything you do. And thanks, Conscious Caracol, for giving this exposure. And I see uh, Michelle Fancel says, thank you so much, dear essay, for what you do and the way you do it. Rob, you and Adams are good, honest men. Thank you very much, guys. You're really, uh, you're very flattering. And uh, Ethne Ronnie says i wanted to fight the COVID regulations from the beginning didn't know how until i met the essa oh excellent so good to Rob, meet you. as we yeah as we uh i see alternative avenues says god bless south africa uh so yeah as we uh wrap up here and start to wind down the uh the the heavy conversation i think there's a lot to digest and chew on here um, what are you currently doing uh, through DSA? What are your current projects? And uh, yeah, just give us a little bit of a showcase there on uh, what's mm. your current focus. Our big campaign right now is obviously the health regulations, which we touched on earlier on, mm. yeah. and that we uh, in court with with Afri Forum. Uh, we saw an, I saw a notice there earlier on, which was fantastic. Uh, the the minister has. Or he withdrew regulations and called and said, "No, they, there's no point in going ahead because they they moot." But as as we commonly agree, they have to go ahead. We have to set a legal precedent in court, so we will be challenging him. And I saw the letter sent sent by Monique from Mon is Monique. Uh, Monique was, Tata, yeah. Good. Monique Tata, lovely, lovely, lovely stuff. Which you know, we are pr proud to be partners with Afro Forum on such an important case. We've also got a, a um, campaign open now, more of a, a survey not related to any policy. But what we're asking the public for is ideas and suggestions on, on reviewing the fuel price structure. So how, how can we bring the fuel price in South Africa down? What can be done about it in a way that government can still meet their objectives, but also still uh, give give consumers a, a break and some fantastic stuff is coming through there we've seen suggestions like uh, reigniting Sassel's coal to fuel uh, uh, ideas and to me that's a, that's a magic thing we should be becoming uh, less less dependent on international oil supplies by by reigniting those those initiatives wouldn't that be wonderful mm. and other other surveys there's always something new coming out uh, once a week because the government gazette gets published on a friday so there's always something new on on a monday morning on on our website but have a look there there's um, uh, over 300 completed campaigns we've got reports on on each one of them and you can also download the public comments for every single one of them obviously no personal details will be there so don't go looking for any new wives or girlfriends or boyfriends, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's great to get an idea what the public does say and some angry comments too, but some really good stuff. Yeah. Mm, all right, now that's that's really good. Um, second to last question: uh, How can people support the essay? What's the easiest? And before you answer, I just want to remind everyone that the link to that website that Rob just uh, described in very much detail is in the description. Easy. You don't even have to go type it in. Just click it there and go visit it after the stream. Well, thanks. Uh, the best the best way to uh, support us is through your participation. Seriously, it doesn't cost anything. Go there. Have your say on, on one or two or all of the campaigns that, that, that we have got or even those that pique your interest but just go and have your say that that is the most valuable thing to to us and if you want to support us support the work we do well then there's the usual do donation things on on our website but mm -hmm. we value participants more than anything else 
Mm, excellent. And then, Rob, my last question is a question that I ask all my guests, and that is just to give you the opportunity to give the audience something that you'd want them to think about this week. It can be just a simple thought or a question or anything, something to keep at the back of their minds to chew on uh, as the, the week progresses. <laughs> yeah, I'll say what, what I always feel, that you, know, you mustn't sit around thinking that government is going to solve solve the problems. We can't let the people who created the problems in the first place come up with solutions because that, that'll just lead to an author, authoritarian top-down approach. I truly believe that uh, change comes from the bottom up and that can only be through an active, engaged and informed civil society. You know, start, start looking around you. There's so many problems that do need uh, solving, There's, but the solutions lie within us. And we all have the capability to solve something, whether it's right next to us, whether it's a, um, reach out and we hold hands and grab our family members first, look after them. But that spreads and it goes to our communities, to our, our larger communities, to our suburbs, to then our municipalities, our provinces, and then eventually our country. But it starts with starts with you. We've got to become more uh, self-reliant and take matters into our own hands in a constructive constructive matter or manner that's it mm. no absolutely i think that's a perfect way to end it rob and before we say goodbye uh, i would also just like to use the opportunity to uh thank the the sponsor of tonight's episode uh they've uh, luckily sponsored many other episodes and gladly sponsored them uh, in the past as well and that is bidvice uh, the only place in South Africa that sells Bitcoin directly to your self-custody wallet, meaning that unlike a traditional crypto exchange, you don't have to trust anyone else to hold it for you. And this uh, removes a lot of risk uh, that is associated with Bitcoin. And if you're interested in, in Bitcoin, uh, you can go to the uh, go listen to their podcast called By the Horns. It's available on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. Very interesting. Gives a South African twist to it. And uh, they've uh, they've taught me a lot and uh, answered many of my questions. So um, they release weekly episodes there, just, uh, just so you're aware. So um, you can go check out their website. There's a link in the description. And you can also uh, just, even if you just have any uh, questions, you can send it their way uh, and definitely go check out their, their podcast. It's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, so yeah, Rob, thank you very much for your time tonight. And also thank you for everything you do there, dear So I know it's not a one-man show, far from it. There's a lot of good people there working behind the scenes and you need to send them in my regards, please. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you and good luck with everything you do. Uh, we've gotten so many uh, messages of support here tonight in the chat. And I'd also just like to use the opportunity to thank everyone that uh, that tuned in. All your questions, all your comments, uh, you really add to the content. And uh, it, it, like I always say, I often get a little bit distracted by the chat because there's always so much interesting and funny stuff going on there. But uh, thank you for your public participation in this uh, in this public broadcast. Uh, I really appreciate it. And yeah, Rob, thank you for your time. It's uh, uh, it's been very interesting, and the conversation is exactly the type of uh, source that I wanted to create. Where if anyone asks you that simple question of like, "What is the essay?" Uh, simple uh, in in quotation marks. Uh, you can just link them to this type of conversation. I think most of their their questions uh, would be answered. The important questions, at least. Fantastic. And thank you so much. The answer was an absolute, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks All to right, your listeners. So, yeah. And the, so cheers, guys. Have a good one. I hope you have an excellent week. And if you're new to this channel, you can also uh, subscribe for more uh, conversations like this. You can also leave your, your thoughts in the comments. I'll read all of them and respond to as many as possible. And thank you to everyone that left a like as well. That uh, really helps out the show. But I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and then also have a safe weekend. Uh, good luck there with the the rolling blackouts. <laughs> I think uh, we'll be uh, we're becoming more adept at dealing with them just on on a public level, not on on a governmental level. But uh, yeah, good luck with that as well. So cheers, guys. Have a good one and.